Nick, you're going to tell us when to start, right? Uh, yes, and folks are populating the room right now. So if y'all want to go ahead and uh, slow roll your introductions, uh, you're welcome to. Oh, sure. Oh, great. All right. Well, I'm going to go ahead and just put a brief slide up here to get us rolling today. Oops, that's not what I meant to do. Hi, everybody, and welcome to the Climate Lit Harvest Party Notes from the Classroom. My name is Stephanie Rola Hune, and I am here today as a facilitator along with Jana Lobello Miller, as we are editors with the um, Climate Literacy Journal that will be coming out here soon. And we are really excited to be with you all today. We're wondering if, as people enter the room, um, if people can, in the chat, go ahead and take a moment to type where you are from and one thing that you think of around harvest time. And if the chat feature, I think if it's not quite working, you can do it in the Q&A as well, but we'll take just a moment to do that. Okay, it looks like it's gonna be a need to be in the Q&A. So you can go ahead and type a little intro in there and then we can open. And I'm not sure, Nick, can people, oh, here we go. So we've got pumpkin pie, the smell of corn, absolutely. All right, well, we will let people continue to think on that, our role in as we go, but we wanted to make sure that we um, had a chance to say hi to everybody out there and say that we're excited to be here. Um, I'm gonna just quickly share our agenda and then we are gonna go ahead and get started for today. But our goal for this session is really to hear from educators and how they are thinking about climate literacy in different ways. And each of today's panelists, who I'll introduce in just a moment, attended um, an educator institute this past summer titled Schools for the Planet Toward Universal Climate Literacy with Children's Literature and Media. And we're so excited that they are willing to take the time to share with us today. So we're gonna hear from our three panelists. Sonia Brat, um, who is a middle school teacher in Brandon, South Dakota. Michael Winnikoff, who is the director of the Science, Science Communications Lab at the University of Minnesota. And Abby Hartzell, who is a high school English teacher at Fridley High School. After they each share, we're going to give them opportunities to make connections across their work. And then we're going to open it up for questions. Um, before we get started, um, is there anything I missed, Jana, as we get going? Thanks, Steph. Nope, I think we are all set to go ahead and get started. All right, with that, I just have to take a moment to get the next set of slides up. So um, with that, I'm gonna go ahead, Sonia, I'm gonna share your slides and you can go ahead and kick us off. Does that sound okay? I'll Sounds great, thank you. And so, as I said, this is Sonia Bratt, who's a middle school teacher. She has taught science and English language arts and gifted education at Brandon Valley Middle School in South Dakota. So here we go and I will hand it over to you. All right, thank you. Get those up. All right. So I am coming from um, Brandon Valley area um, from South Dakota. So I have uh, started us off with the prairie here. We are in prairie land. And um, once again, this is a view from the middle school classroom. I'm gonna go ahead and move slides for me, Steph, please. Thank you. All right, so some current growth that we have kind of happening at our school, um, mainly inspired by the Climate Literacy Institute this summer, um, just starting. In my ELA classroom, I'm new to ELA this year, so it's a wonderful opportunity to bring many different things in. So one of the things that I have created is in the spring, we're gonna have a water unit um, focused on, I kind of started even before I went to the Institute on Memory of Water and it all tied in lovely. Um, several different read alouds, many of those that we also featured at the Institute, but in also other places that I've been able um, to kind of pick up and have a lens for, like Old Turtle, um, We Are Water Protectors, Change Things, those types of things. Um, I also have been bringing in lots of different writing prompts, um, just starting our day off using our interactive notebook 
And then just sharing, um, not with just me, but also sharing out to other people in my department. Then when I kind of think of, of my school, I was like, hmm, how can I bring this into whole school? So one of the things that I have in the, you can see up on the slide there is the top left. Um, we do homeroom slides that are for every morning right away. So even next week, I have um, been kind of featuring different parts um, so we can start having some common language around climate literacy. And so that's kind of way I brought it to whole school as well as um, I really started to look for openings and other content areas, kind of sharing out with coworkers whenever um, I hear there might be an opening for a place that we could add some climate literacy, been doing that. Um, also another thing that's gonna be happening shortly for us in our library is we're gonna have a book showcase because is what we realized is we got a lot of new books, for example, um, we've got the first rule of climate club, for example, uh, two degrees might be something that they might be interested to get started in. Um, so kind of featuring books that are going to be connections for those kids. Um, I have lots of future hopes um, since I've been involved in this, looking at the outdoor classroom is potentially something we can build. We have a start and maybe eventually that's something that um, our school can build in. Looking at maybe a food growing space, thinking about composting, because right now we have so much waste going at our lunchrooms, looking at recycling um, more readily and helping kids understand the terminology behind that. Um, hopefully we have some kids that might be interested in forming and creating an earth club. We have so many clubs in our school. So I think that'd be another excellent connection to reach kids. And then also um, to continue making curriculum connections. Um, I've been absolutely wowed in looking at um, it's so many different spaces and places within our building and realizing that would be a wonderful opportunity to implement some more climate literacy. All right, staff, do you wanna go ahead and move us forward? Thank you. When I was thinking about reflecting um, this year already and thinking from the time that we did the, the Summer Institute to now, um, I'm so excited because we have so many resources. We have excellent resources and also thinking that um, it really is all about our lens. It's really a place where we need to be thinking very intentionally um, often about where we can bring our climate literacy in. And once you start to do that, you realize that there are so many places and spaces in your everyday teaching that you can insert. Maybe it's just even um, one, one terminology piece a day, but it's still bringing that in. Maybe it's having books accessible in your classroom all the time that, that are gonna connect not only with your topic, but are bringing in some of those climate um, pieces. And then the last piece um, that I was kind of reflecting upon was most definitely thinking about um, hope. So we have all these resources, just to recap here, available with us to have so many places that we can bring them in. It's all about looking at our lens. Um, we can pay attention and we have this climate literacy, but the hope part is the big part. Um, what I noticed is I surveyed middle schoolers at the very beginning of the year. First of all, I asked them, um, what is hope? which was very interesting. I think they have a pretty um, amazing definition of what hope can be. Then the other piece of it was, what kinds of things do they hope for a better future and where they can insert more hope? And it was really interesting without any prompting, how many of these students really put climate crisis on there? So it is something that they're aware of. It's something that they know that we can bring forward. And I think they're definitely ready to do so. Um, when I think about the reason there's so much investment here for me, I'm looking at water. Water is absolutely crucial to our whole planet system. And it's crucial for so many of these children we know, even in our area, we have the Big Sioux River, which is notorious for not being very clean and having been dumped in so greatly. So it's a wonderful um, connection that's close. It is literally in our backyard here. And we can see um, not only how it can be beautiful and amazing, but we also know that it needs a lot of love. So I think water is something that is an easy investment that you can talk people into um, kind of looking at. Then it's caretakers. I think that we have so many children that need to be um, learning about what it is that they can even, what they, why, you know, what it is that they even need to be fostering a love in, and in the case, this earth, and they need opportunities to see that they can be the caretakers. Right now, um, you know, not every child is having opportunity to go outside all the time and maybe not encouraged to do so. Um, so it's even, 
thinking about how we can get them outside to understand what it is that they even need to be looking for to be taken care of in the first place. And then um, lastly, an investment, I think, is that it's a, such a healthy space. And I think if we have learned anything since 2020, it's how we really hope for our children that they can be healthy and safe. And I think in the outdoors and connecting them with nature and the planet and taking care of it so that they know they have a space, a healthy space to live in. So if you wouldn't mind moving stuff, thanks. So just to kind of re recap what I have here. Um, so reflections that I have is we have resources available to us in so many places, not only, not just multimodal, uh, not only our books and things like that, but most definitely in videos in um, people. We have so many people that know so much and making our, you know, making our community aware and then also connecting with them. It's also about um, our lens. How are we looking for opportunities to educate children um, about this climate in which, in which we have and this earth in which they live in? When we pay attention, we can easily insert these climate literacy concepts. And I think that the re biggest reflection I've had is just taking that lens every day has definitely um, been inspiring, not only to me, but hopefully to some other people as well. And then also thinking that children do have hope and we need to facilitate opportunities to define it in the context of our climate. And then once again, investing in our water, because it's so important. Um, investing for me is being a caretaker and we need to foster a sense of ownership as caretakers with our students. They need the opportunities to understand why they even are the caretakers because it is for them. And then nature, um, like Frank Lloyd Wright says, study nature, love nature, stay close to nature. It will never fail you. Um, having been a science teacher, I think I often connect with that as well, um, but we're healthy in this space for sure. And how can we keep their, their space healthy for them or make it more so? All right, next slide, please. Thank you. Some challenges that I see in ongoing questions. Um, a challenge that I have noted is that the time to collaborate educators beyond our normal days in the classroom is limited. Um, that's, I think that's pretty common to many educators is just understanding that, that sometimes we, we are going be above and beyond. So how can we insert these things um, together and do it well? when we have to add a little bit more time into our day. Um, the opportunities are growing in this area, another challenge, but a coordinated effort or approach would be helpful. Currently organizations like NSTA are promoting information and I noticed that they're in their magazine that they recently also are addressing climate literacy, but how can we connect it all to gain momentum? How can we help each other out and do that? And then another challenge I see is accountability as a group to continue the work. This summer was so awesome and how can we still hold the accountability as a group to continue this work. And then some ongoing questions as well. Um, what are our main focus goals for climate literacy? We have so many avenues in which we can go. Could main goals play into a type of advertisement to share with others and help them better understand the context? Um, I personally left this Summer Institute so excited, but grasping at why it is so necessary and to have um, a, a short, succinct description that I can share with others. Um, so they understand what it is that we truly did um, start to work on. How can we acknowledge climate literacy facilitators in our buildings? Is there a way that we can highlight them? Can the University of Minnesota create a certificate program or degree to acknowledge the importance of this work and connect it to teacher continuing education? Because let's be real, the income that's associated with lane change is important. And I think um, that's important to kind of consider as well as we get people on board. We all want to do it. I get that, I know I definitely do, but it's also important to acknowledge that I think as the work continues. All right, next slide. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak with you and sharing a meaningful conversation about our beautiful earth today. Thank you. Yay, thank you, Sonia. Giving the, the claps here and just, um, I know that the weird thing about virtual space is not sometimes feeling all of that response, but I'm excited. So thank you for taking that time. I'm gonna just take a moment um, to stop this share. And then um, I think, um, Michael, do you, are you prepared to share next? Does that sound okay? Yeah, that sounds great. Okay, I just noticed there's something in the chat. I didn't know if there was, okay. We got a woo, thank you, Sonia, so good job. <laughs> 
Well, great. Um, so before I start sharing my screen, I just wanted to say thank you, to Sonia, for the presentation, but also because she's a middle school teacher. And I have a ninth grader who just went into high school. And I can see just in the first couple months how the foundation that was laid in middle school for his values and the things that he studied and um, the skills are really benefiting him. And um, it was just a crucial formative time in his life. So thank, thank you to all the middle school teachers out there, but um, just an acknowledgement of the importance of that work. Thank you. So I'm going to try and share my screen. Um, and hopefully this will go smoothly. Uh, okay. So um, can everybody see the first slide? I should say the Science Communication Lab with pictures of some of my students. So thank you very much for inviting me to speak today. This is a great way to follow up on the Summer Institute, which was inspirational for me and uh, really happy to be part of this community. I run a program at the University of Minnesota called the Science Communication Lab, and it's an internship program that brings together students from different academic disciplines to communicate about the research that we're doing at the University of Minnesota. And I'm gonna show you some of the things that we've done, but at the core, we bring students from the humanities, the sciences, from graphic design disciplines together. And we talk about telling stories in ways that are relevant and compelling for the general public. And so um, there's a training program that the writers go through to learn a little bit about storytelling and about um, fundamentals of making science interesting and, and, and accessible to the general public. And then generally, after they do their first or second project, they'll team up with graphic designers to do things that um, illustrate in more than one modality. So um, you'll see on the left an article that one of my students wrote. Um, and then on the right, a student wrote an article and then the team of graphic designers put it into a layout. Um, the designers also do posters for our events. We're trying to make things lively and, and um, we all we want to be visually compelling, but we also want things to be relevant both for the audience and for the people we're representing. So the scientists have to be able to identify like with the stuff we're doing and they're always part of our design process and our research process. And the, the pieces that I want to talk to you about today are sitting at the intersection of research, storytelling and, and art. And they're all done collaboratively by students. Some of them, um, I think, are adaptable in different ways to high school classrooms, middle school classrooms. Others, um, I'll just tell you what we're doing. And it's probably not possible with the amount of time you have and probably the skill sets that your students bring. But um, maybe some ideas will emerge. So um, this is a project that started with a story that was written by a student about fecal microbial contamination and the need for municipalities in particular to know the difference between different kinds of contamination, E. coli contamination, so that they know when to shut down beaches and waters. The research um, was kind of, the, the first article was done by a student working on her own, but then she identified some things that could be explained better visually um, and then worked with the graphic designer to create the poster that's in the middle it talks about the different sources of contamination and you know what their impacts are. And then on the far right, they broke that up into little tweets that could go out um, to promote the article, but also to just focus people on one aspect or another of the, the research. So that was the first um, time we really had a kind of a nice package where, where everybody was collaborating. And then we went on to do some other things. And I'm gonna take a break from the slideshow to show you the very first part of a video that we did um, about the impact of earthworms in Northern climates. So uh, let's see, I think I need to stop the share. And then share again, so I grab my other screen. So all this work was done by undergraduate students. People have been moving around this planet for a long time. And where we go, other living things go too. Plants, animals, microbes, they come with us as we move from place to place. Even the tiniest travel companions can have a huge impact on the landscape. Take earthworms, for example. 
They disappeared from North America during the last ice age, but when people from other continents brought seeds, crops, and animals, earthworms hitched to ride. That means that the earthworm, as well known locally as loons and walleye, is actually an invasive species. And when earthworms took up residence in our forests, they transformed them in profound ways. So while earthworms may be great for our gardens, they can be bad news for forest ecosystems. They make it difficult for plants to take root and expose them to weather and animals foraging for food. Earthworms may even be affecting the microorganisms found in forest soils in ways we don't fully understand. This matters because those microbes play an important role in carbon and nitrogen cycles. What we do know is that in the presence of earthworms, soil microbes can release additional greenhouse gases, which contribute to climate change. I'm going to stop there and uh, go back to showing my slide presentation because it's it's almost four minutes and I would be taking up most of my time. But um, at the end, I'll show you our website. Um, and so you can uh, take a look at this. It's on the website along with some of the other materials. Okay, so um, we also do workshops and uh, try science communication training. And I wanted to show you a quick example that I think is a good one that might be adaptable for the classroom. Um, so this was a project in collaboration with the US Fish and Wildlife Service. And the idea was to take an expert, um, tease out an experience that was relevant, um, to the public and then to build a workshop around that that would allow students in their, in, in this case, interns in training, work through scenarios that they may have to um, deal with when they're encountering the public. So just, there's a lot more to this than I'm gonna show you, but essentially um, when you're a conservation biologist and you're trying to restore an oak savanna, you have to kill trees to do that. And people get very upset. And one of the most brutal um, ways of doing that is to girdle a tree. And it has a lot of benefits, um, but also strong reactions from the public. And so um, Faye Healy, who's the, the, the conservation biologist, gave a presentation. She talked about her experience and how people react. We looked at why this was done, um, in what circumstances. We gave them some um, basic materials to, to read and to think a little bit about. Um, and then, oh, sorry, and then we, painted a scenario. You are a research intern on the year after this beautiful tree has been girdled and you're out doing a survey of the wildlife that's growing up in the surrounding area. And people come up to you and they say, this is our favorite tree. Why did you do this? You know, And then the students have to think a little bit about how they're gonna deal with that. And there's a role play. So they're given this scenario, they're given a few research materials, like three article abstracts and a poster with some graphics. And then they're asked to sort of interact with the public and do some role playing around how that might work. And so we try to encourage them to be factual, um, be congenial. We teach them how to diffuse the situation and how to decide what message they want to convey, but also to react to people. Um, and so this is a, a thing that we try to do that represents the, the learning by doing aspect of what we're trying to do in the science communication lab for our, our students, but then also modeling that for other members of the community. So I'm gonna focus for the time I have left on this project we've been working on for a few years um, in relation to white nose syndrome in bats. And again, this, this, this is one of those tweet decks, we call them, that came out of an article that was written, a poster that was completed by students, and then, um, you know, then we moved on to, to doing this book project. So the researcher you see um, sampling um, the fungi in a cave in northern Minnesota at the Sudan mine is Christine Solomon, and she is a researcher at the University of Minnesota. So we had her come and visit, talk to the students, and then um, we eventually started to work on this book project. And I'm going to just show you bits and pieces of how we got there. Um, we talked with Christine and then we, we did a whiteboard session uh, about what elements of the research could be turned into a children's book or a story. And what did we want to do? Well, we wanted to accomplish a couple of things. We wanted to provide role models. We wanted to be speaking to a diverse audience. We wanted to um, explain the science in, in, in terms that were credible, but also fun. And we wanted to tell a story that could be you know absorbed by sort of a for the fourth grade to sixth grade audience. And so um, this is one of my students, Lauren, who's now working at a marketing firm in New York. 
but um, she was part of the team that wrote the script, or wrote the, the text for the book. I mean, we start with the very basic, like sketching things out, you know, and then kind of move through things like character sketches with, with the designers, different layout options, um, color and character kinds of uh, sketches to try and figure out what this thing should look like and how we can put it together. And um, I'm just kind of showing you different things that I, I introduced to the students to try and get them to start thinking about layout and about storytelling and about how to move through visually while you're also moving you know, through the, the story in words. And we did a lot of work um, trying to map this out. And we came up with a very rough, um, I don't know what the Ohio Treatment Fund um, graphic on there is, so apologize for that. But the rest of it, these are a couple of pages from the book that we created in, as a dummy that we could take out to librarians and, and ask people to read it to students to try and get a sense of whether we're reaching our audience and whether the language and the levels were good. And, uh, and all this was done in collaboration kind of in the studio environment that we create. Um, the University of Minnesota has a fabulous children's book librarian and a collection. And so we brought it to the, the librarian who gave us a very long lecture about the realities of book publishing and how difficult it was to get it done and how this actually, but she also gave us some really good tips about um, page turners and about how, how you have to, uh, how people are going to use this book in, in the classroom, right? It's got to be easy enough for students to absorb with pictures that are big enough so that they can see from a bit of a distance. And if you're going for a slightly older audience, you want to provide research materials that people can use for their reports. So we learned quite a bit from that, that process. Thank you so much, Michael, for, yeah. for sharing. Mm -hmm. I, we, I'm sure there are many questions that are coming up. I know I have some. Um, okay, I'm sorry. Should I, should I just wrap now? And uh, That would be wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> so I just want to say one more thing, that all these things are really great, but um, what, what we're starting to realize is that we need, we can use these and then tie them to curriculum materials. And so we're trying to develop curriculum materials. So these can be the teasers that take you into deeper into the conversation. And, and the last thing that I think we need to do now is to tie this to um, a pra practical skills and to let people know that there are real opportunities um, to make change. And that those opportunities are both in terms of learning, but also in terms of the jobs of the future will be in sustainability. And the earlier we can start building skills and training people um, and tie that message to hope to of hope to practical skills, the better off we are, I think. So I'll stop there and I appreciate the time and sorry I went a little over. All right. Again, claps for Michael. Thank you so much for sharing. I am getting excited. And as Donna said, also having a lot of thoughts right away and making connections as well. Um, and with that, we are going to turn to our um, third panelist, Abby um, Hartzell, who is talking from the lens of a high school English language arts teacher. So I'm going to go ahead and share your slides, Abby, and then you can just tell me when you want to move on to the next slide. Sound good? Sounds good. Yeah. Michael and Sonia, thanks for sharing. It just was so awesome to hear your thoughts. And I'm just, yeah, as everyone is feeling very energized. Um, so my name's Abby. I am a high school English teacher. I just actually finished my student teaching last year. So I'm very fresh. Um, side note, I'm also in an airport right now, unfortunately. So you may hear some background noise. There's been some announcements, but uh, just ignore. Um, so I want to talk about a specific unit that I taught to 11th grade English students last year at the high school where I did my student teaching. I co-planned this unit with a fellow teacher, um, and it was called a climate mini unit. So it's three weeks, the very last three weeks of the school year. So we had our 11th graders were feeling very ready to kind of launch from 11th grade and be in summer. But I think this really got their attention and was exciting. So our overarching question was, what is climate change and how can I engage critically with this issue? And over the course of this unit, we read, very, read and watched various texts, including a documentary, short story, picture book, social media posts, podcasts, personal videos, tons of different genres, and analyzed these texts 
through different discussion questions. And you can see them, I have screenshots of my slides up here. So one question was identify the specific crisis addressed in the text and then explain how the creator engages the reader and makes the reader care about the crisis. So an example is we watched David Attenborough's um, A Life on Our Planet documentary and the students really were quite enamored by it, thought a lot about it, had a lot of great questions and had to identify what is the crisis. And really that is a very broad crisis of climate change. And then how does the reader make you care or the author, how does David Attenborough wrap you in and get you excited or feeling scared about climate change? Um, and so I think they were generating some understanding of how climate change is this massive crisis, but there's all these many things under it to understand. It's like this umbrella with all of these categories. So like the picture book we read was We Are the Water Protectors, which focused specifically on the tar sands pipeline. So thinking about how a different text can take a different lens on an issue and give you a focused view or a broader view. And all of those texts are important in generating understanding. You can go to the next slide. Um, so a couple highlights from the unit. We did a no want to know learned thing where I just got a better sense of what do 11th graders already know about climate change in a large public super socioeconomically and racially diverse school. Like, what do they already understand? What do they want to know? And it was a massive range of things. Um, we had an all class discussion at the end, which is like my favorite moment as a teacher, just going around and hearing how the students reacted to the text, asking questions of each other, engaging with them, talking about what they felt was most impactful. On the last day of school, I really pushed the students. Most other classes, they were like watching movies because it was like the end of school, but I was like, we're gonna talk about individual versus collective action. And so we had a good discussion about that. And then our check-in questions, I tried to be culturally relevant, bringing in student voice and student participation. And then at the very end, we had this blue marble activity um, where we gave, we ordered blue, like a bag of blue marbles, gave each student a blue marble and had them think about one commitment they may make given all of these texts that we've read that they want to do to take care of our blue marble, which is our planet. And I'm no longer teaching at that school, obviously, but my um, cooperating teacher said that a student who's now a 12th grader came by in the fall and was like, hey, like, Ms. Williams, like, I don't think I have my blue marble. I think I might have lost it. But she was so impressed that he remembered that. And that that was kind of the idea is like having this little token of that unit and hopefully it'll carry students through. Um, next slide. These are some examples of check-in questions that I created that were sort of getting students thinking about climate, but not in like a super like intense way. So what is your favorite type of weather? And then the next one is, um, this was like the most fun. What is your favorite fruit or vegetable? We got into this raging debate about whether or not you can eat a raw tomato, which was apparently a debate. I didn't realize that, um, but those were great ways to kind of get us thinking about climate and the environment but without forcing students to come in with a ton of background knowledge. Because as I said, like we had such a range of experiences and the idea of the unit was just to kind of get some exposure for students. Um, you can go to the next slide. So thinking back on this three week unit, um, I am in my first year of teaching, but it was the most engaged I've ever felt as an educator. Um, because I am so passionate about climate change and, and climate activism, I think that they found that to be contagious and it was a really exciting unit. We had some of the most student voice that I'd seen. Um, we also, I forgot to put this on the slide, but I think a massive part of it that was so engaging is that most of my students were really passionate about social justice. We read a lot of books about race and identity in school, but we very much centered the overlap between climate change and social justice, climate justice. And I think that was super engaging for students and helped them think about social justice from a new framework and also in some ways decentered race which I think is a great way to have critical thinking on all different levels where it's not like race is so critical but it's not the only way to think about um, you know social justice topics so thinking about it from an environmental justice perspective complicated that understanding and I think gave a really rich um, perspective to students um, and as I said like critical literacy climate literacy thinking about what is truth how does an author engage their viewer? Um, what are the different genres and how do they communicate? That is a fundamental part of our preserving our democracy and, and valuing students thinking critically about the, um, the things that they see, especially when, with our little mini social media um, exploration. Um, and it left me feeling really energized for future applications of climate literacy. And um, so you can go to the next slide. Um, 
because I am now a ninth grade English teacher at a different high school. And I'm so excited for the opportunity to do another climate mini unit. I wanna incorporate climate into a lot of things. We're reading the Odyssey right now. And I feel like some of those topics of journeying home and things you could talk about migration or bring in topics, but I really do wanna do another one of these little mini units where we have all of the texts about climate. Um, but I also need support from other educators. As a first year teacher, I often have curriculum that's already been written for me, which is great. And then also I find sometimes it's hard to like fit into things that I think are really important to teach. Um, and then a challenge I witnessed at the end of the unit last year with the 11th graders is with this blue marble activity, I think it was impactful in some ways because it was memorable, but it also sort of reduced all of this really awesome, complex social justice oriented exploration we've done of climate into, I'm gonna use a reusable straw or I'm gonna you know not use a plastic bag. I was like, oh man, like individual versus collective action. Like, did it actually make an impact? Like what is our our step forward and ideally I would love to see students say like I want to take another environmental science class or I want to learn more about this or I want to read a book so I want to figure out a way to kind of gear the um, unit more towards the direction of further exploration versus like I'll do one tiny thing in my own life which is obviously also important there's so much to talk about there but that is a challenge that I encountered um, and then the opportunities I see and the excitement I have looking ahead are the idea of like career technical education connection. So many of our like CTE teachers are talking about, okay, wait, like a wind turbine technician is the biggest potential field for students to go into who are in high school or, you know, with the Inflation Reduction Act, thinking about all the money that's pouring into converting our energy grid to um, all renewable sources. And so I want students to see that too, because as their blue marble could be like, I wanna go into this career versus, um, or in addition to using my reasonable slot, straw. Um, and then finally, um, yeah, as I said, like ninth graders, they're ready for it. I'm so excited. I will definitely modify the unit I created because I think ninth graders need and are excited about different things, but um, I'm looking forward to diving in and using some of the resources that I learned about today. I think it's gonna be great. All right, thank you so much, Abby. Sonia. Michael, Abby, thank you so much for being with us and for sharing. Um, what I really appreciate about this time is just hearing from three educators coming from different contexts. Um, you're all modeling um, what it means to have a question and then to take the time and space to be able to think about what that question means for you coming together collectively, um, sharing stories as you were doing your workshop together with the summer conference. Um, and sharing resources, as well as um, then modeling for your students how to take that into action. And I really appreciated um, being able to hear things. I know I have a few things to take away, um, thinking about hope, thinking about the need for, for stories that are related and connected to students where they are right now, and being able to challenge our students to think about the futures that they want um, and the, the, the role that they have um, in creating those futures. Um, so thank you so much. Um, I wanted to give us time to talk across our panelists um, for each of you to have a moment to share any connections or ahas that you heard um, related to each other's work. Um, and then, of course, we'll open it up to um, the rest of our participants to come and share any questions they have for our panelists. Tanya, do you want to start and then we'll I sure can. Um, so definitely, I love the stories to connect. I think that we're continually working in ways in which we can have our students connect, connect to each other, connect to text, connect to, the, connect to the world. And so, Michael, thank you so much for sharing different ways that we can look at stories and even create stories instantly. I was like, oh, yeah, we definitely should be doing some um, script writing and starting inspiring and getting me excited about that. So thank you very much for sharing that part. And then also, um, Abby, wow, you're doing great. Keep going, first year teacher. This is awesome. Um, but definitely looking at individual versus collective and looking at multiple texts and different different modes in which we can continue to, um, to connect with kids. Um, the blue marble activity, absolutely. If it helps them remember just for a moment in time, 
what it is that they were talking about, even it was just the reusable straw, but the point is, is they were stopping and thinking and making some connections and hopefully those connections will continue to grow. Also, I do love your idea of CT. I know I've started connecting um, in that realm, realm as well with our CT teachers, um, but thinking about that this is more for them. And also Michael and your connection as well, um, the skills for the future are, are going to be sustainability. So if we're developing and building on that language right now, that's in, incredibly clever for us to be um, um, moving forward as educators and helping those um, kids move into their future. Thank you. Go ahead, Michael. So many things to, <clears throat> to think about and <clears throat> really inspiring actually to, to see you working the way you're working in the classroom. I feel like working with college students is a whole other ball of wax. And um, I'm just impressed that with the work you're doing. But there are a couple of things that, that I thought about, um, conversations that we've been having internally and then, and then things that I've been turned on to that I think could be really interesting. I mean, one of the conversations that we've been having for a number of years with some of the high school student or teachers that we've been talking to is whether SciComm can be the, the assessment tool. So rather than testing um, for knowledge, can demonstrating your knowledge through science communication skills collaboratively with other people, can that be the assessment of knowledge? And, and so with that, there are some opportunities to try and do some of the things we're doing at a level that's appropriate for the amount of time and the amount of skills that the students bring. But more and more, the younger students have these fabulous skills in media production and, and drawing and web development. And so it becomes more and more possible for them to do sophisticated work um, from a production standpoint. But um, the other thing that came up, this idea of individual versus collective responsibility and how that can be a, a trap for people, um, for me as well, in thinking about our responsibility and how we can move forward. Um, systems analysis is one of the tools that I think is essential for climate and sustainability. I listened to the sustainability officer from Starbucks talk about a week and a half ago. And when they asked, what can we do to help students or help people move in those, this direction? It's give them this, the skills they need and, and systems modeling and systems analysis is one of those. And, and I think it could, I don't know how to bring that into the classroom. And some of the, what we're trying to think about, how do we tie that kind of methodology to the content that we wanna teach? Um, but that allows you to sort of look at your responsibility from this much larger context that, that um, things need to change systemically for us to make progress. But at the same time, there's another tool we've been using um, with inclusive science communication, which is kind of an individual development plan. So in the, in the case of wanting to be more inclusive in your communication style, you know, you have a goal, then how are you actually going to get there? Are you going to try and practice? Are you going to develop some materials. And I, I wonder if the individual development plan could be worked into a classroom setting where, oh, I want to be, you know, a wind turbine technician. Well, what does it take to get there, you know, and have people think through those steps as a way of building hope, I think, because if you have a goal and you have a method and a way to get there, um, then you can take individual responsibility without feeling like every plastic straw you um, have to use is killing the planet and making you a bad person. Anyways. Um, yeah, wow. That's, these are just like such important and great ideas. And I'm trying to like make sure that I'm mentally keep track of them. I, I love this idea of like, you know, the goal setting. And um, I think it's so true that the individual versus collective action I wonder if maybe in the future units, I would wanna put that conversation like much earlier because I think students will start to get more understanding of it as we encounter different texts and then having a better understanding then could you know culminate the unit in thinking about their own personal goal or their career thought. I think maybe later in high school, maybe not for ninth graders, but um, and then as something you said earlier with like assessment, Michael, for like, um, assessment looking like the communication piece itself. I really like that too. There's so many of my ninth graders who are like drawing cartoons like in class, like that just love to draw. And so 
giving them an assignment that would have them develop a way to make some sort of complex um, or not even complex, but some sort of scientific thing. Like the infographics that you showed us as examples of, I could totally see ninth graders getting excited about that. And then that's so interdisciplinary because they could be learning something in their science class about climate. Ninth graders, I think, are now required to do earth sciences in Minnesota. So taking that idea and then in their English class, they create some sort of way to communicate in a story. And I just, so beautiful, so liberal arts. Um, so yeah, that gets me excited. And then Sonia, I also wanted to just mention that like earlier when you were talking, you mentioned the potential for embedding climate literacy into like so many aspects of the school, not just like necessarily in the classroom, but maybe in the cafeteria or in small ways in your classroom, like with vocabulary or with the check-in or things like that. And that's great and very inspiring to me because I think I get a little bit caught up in being like, okay, when do I have time to carve out like three weeks or something for climate? when that doesn't have to be the only way to get it done, especially when I feel like I'm limited by the books that I have to teach this year, so. Well, thank you all for sharing those insights across your work. There are lots of things that are, are popping in my head as well. I think particularly just the care that all of you are thinking about in a word that I heard for all of you is this connection, like making that connection for students to the work. So thank you for that as you're thinking about it in different ways. Um, we do have a couple of questions right now that are popping up in the Q&A and people can continue to put those and we'll make sure we end on time for our panelists as well. Um, but the first one, um, and I don't know, Nick, if there's like a the best place to maybe send people for this as well, but people from the panel might have documentaries you recommend, or if there's just a great resource um, from the Center for Climate Literacy that we should be using. Well, maybe to get us started, I'll speak um, from the void uh, about the Center for Climate Literacy. Um, and if folks are interested in finding documentaries or films, we will be increasingly populating our website, climatelit.org, um, with films, um, short and long, feature length, and, and um, more accessible films um, in the months to come. So that can be a place to check out. Um, and it was mentioned, uh, I think uh, Abby mentioned it, um, uh, David Attenborough's documentaries are often a good place to start. Um, I'll also give a pitch uh, before uh, we hear from panelists about um, potential documentaries too. I'll give a pitch for line three, uh, LN3 colon um, seven teachings from the Anishinaabe in Resistance, um, which is about a 30 minute documentary um, about indigenous resistance to uh, the Line Three oil pipeline in northern Minnesota. Um, those are my those are my two suggestions. All right, another question. Um, I'll read it. Um, this is for our panelists. How can we engage our students in creating stories about climate related issues? And follow up, how do we create a structure, perhaps online mini courses or otherwise to share tips and give students and teachers tools to design and create um, e-picture books um, and things that can be used right away with, with their student or with, with themselves? I can just mention quickly that there's a lot of really good, um, it's actually funny because um, Stephanie was my professor for our technology class, but there's like a lot of good technology for creating picture books, like maybe not books, but there's like Pixton where you can create these little graphic comics and various different just like um, apps that students can use that already have so much of like the groundwork in place. You could just tell students, okay, think of a story that's related to climate and then you can like tell it through this. Um, be fantastic if we could create some sort of element on the climate lit website where this is like the coolest meta thing where we have not only like books written by authors but also like stories created by students that are trying to communicate maybe that could be like a, another section of like student created work on there
there's a lot of free material online that um, people can use as the building block. So, I mean, if it's if an, it's an obstacle to, to students because they don't feel like they can draw um, or they want to tell a story in a very simple way, there there's something called the noun project where you can get icons, like thousands and thousands of icons on all sorts of different topics. And I, I run in a little exercise as a storytelling thing where I give three icons randomly chosen to students and I ask them to tell a short story. So it's kind of like picture cubes or whatever they're called. But it, you know, it, we get into like story structure and how that all works, but you can you can use very simple like you know iconographic kinds of things with voiceover to tell a story that's compelling and um you know scaffolding things like write the script what would you want to see if you were going to imagine the story being told visually and then um just asking them to do the basic work of learning to tell the story that they want to tell um with very simple tools can be i think a good way to get started um and and to the extent that kids like to get up and talk to one another um, and show their work and perform for one another this sort of three things story can be really great and you can ask them to tell a climate related story and you give them a set of icons and and have them imagine like maybe it's a maybe it's a wind turbine and a hard hat and a pair of boots and so then so so tell the story of somebody who's working on this job site or whatever. Um, simple, simple tools to just get get started with students and get them out there thinking on their feet. I agree. It's learning how to, to tell the stories. And one of the things, like, for example, I also do something similar to what Michael just mentioned, but also like and then stories so we can start the prompt and then they can finish it and Sometimes I'll guide them and say, okay, do, how do you think this should end and where should we go with it? Um, so just practicing that storytelling and then um, like Abby's idea, de most definitely of how can we share this with other people, um, whether it's we're recording it like on something like Screencastify and sharing it as we have visual, as we have just created it, or maybe it's actually refining it and getting better at telling that story and having it available. But I do think, um, Anytime we can connect and build on story and they understand the parts of it um, and become part of it, then they're going to be engaged in it. Thank you. And I just want to mention a resource from the University of Minnesota that highlights um, immigrant stories, but also has a great model for how to help students build stories. If you go to immigrantstories.umn.edu, you just click a button, it says create your story, and it provides you step-by-step -step ways of um, building a narrative and inserting images. And I think that that's a great model to think about what might a tool look like as you were, I think, saying, Merrick, in that question for the design, like what would the, an accessible model that students and teachers could go into and just like build from within? It's, it's a great system. Yeah. You know, the other thing that comes to mind as we're talking about this is that the so storytelling is a really great and a, and a necessary skill, but empathy and how do you build empathy for your audience and then how do you how do you negotiate difficult conversations and of course this could be applied to a lot of different topics that teachers have to encounter but in that everybody loves trees exercise, you know we we gave them a whole bunch of helping phrases like if you need to pivot a conversation away from a topic that's uncomfortable, how do you do that? How do you build empathy with your audience by saying, you know, for example, like I felt the same way when I first learned about tree girdling. But what I learned by talking to the scientists is that it's really important that we like take these ecosystem changes seriously. So, you know, teaching them about the pivot and about going in with a set of things that they want to say, but being empathetic and flexible in their communication, um, I think is really important if you're gonna persuade and, and build community around climate change and climate literacy. That, that brings me back to the idea of critical literacy and thinking about audience and message and purpose. If you were to give students a prompt to not only tell a story about climate, but to 
gear it towards, or maybe you could do two versions, like gear it towards like a preschool student and then gear it towards like a middle school student that could get them not only thinking about climate, obviously, but also about like argument and analysis and critical literacy, which is, I think these things are so interconnected and have to be taught together in the classroom. Mm -hmm. Any final thoughts um, from our panelists as we are all going to walk away with um, different concrete ideas of how we might continue to engage climate literacy? I just wanna say the biggest thank you again, because these are all folks doing the work, first of all, creatively and engaging in important work, and then taking the time on a Friday afternoon to share it with y'all. So thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me. Yeah, thanks thank for you. the opportunity. Thank you for reigniting the fire again. Mm -hmm. Yay. All right, with that, um, any final announcements, Nick? Uh, stay tuned for more programming from the Center for Climate Literacy coming up. Uh, we'll be sending out a newsletter here soon, uh, so just check your inboxes for that. But you can always reach us uh, via email at climatelit at umn.edu. Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Have a great weekend. Yes. <laughs>